Good evening. I'm David Assad, the Chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals for the City of Fall River. At 6 p.m. on Thursday, January 17, 2019, we are meeting at one government center in the committee hearing room. This is a meeting of a local public body, and as such is subject to the provisions of Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 38, Section 20, commonly known as the Open Meeting Law. Pursuant to Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 38, Section 20, Subsection F, I hereby notify all persons in attendance that this meeting is being recorded with both video and audio devices. Our recording secretary this evening is Brittany Farrier, the lady to my left. She's recording an audio version, and Fall River Government TV, Alex Mello, is recording both the video and audio version. If anyone desires to make an audio, video, or combination recording thereof, please notify me now, and I shall make a public announcement of your intention. Alan Zarek, WSAR. Anyone else? Okay, so Mr. Zurich is making a audio version, yes? Audio and video. Audio and video. Uh, present this evening are permanent members from my left to right, James Calkins, Secretary, Attorney Carolyn Morissette, Vice Chair, Alternate Member Dan Dupere, Alternate Member David Saber. The gentleman to my immediate right is William Roth, Director of Planning for the City of Fall River. Brittany all petitions to be considered and properly advertised and all interested parties notified in accordance with the rules and regulations of the Zoning Board of Appeals in Massachusetts General Law Chapter 48 is amended. Yes. I declare the January 17, 2019 regularly scheduled meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals of the City of Fall River open for such business as shall regularly come before it. I remind all persons presenting before the Board, including the petitioners, abutters, anyone in support or anyone opposed to the petition, that your presentation should be limited to three minutes. Questions and responses must be directed through the chair. The board's rules and regulations direct the board to specifically look for information which supports the petitioner's claim. As such, the petitioner should, should identify and factually support the basis for the petition. I hereby advise the petitioners and all interested persons that this board is the Zoning Board of Appeals. This board's authority exists pursuant to Massachusetts General Law Chapter 48 and is limited in scope and deals with the use of land as regulated by Chapter 86 of the ordinances of the City of Fall River. Additional permits, licenses, reviews, and or approvals may be required for the specific development and or use which is the subject of the petition before the Zoning Board this evening. The clerks in the building, planning, engineering, and licensing departments are competent in the discharge of their duties as clerks. They are, however, not lawyers and are not competent to give legal advice. The action taken by this board has a real and lasting effect upon the title to your real estate. I urge all petitioners to seek competent legal counsel before filing your petitions and after a decision of the board has been made. For example, there is a city ordinance 2015-11, section 10-1, making site plan reviews, requiring site plan reviews. A copy of the ordinance is available at the city clerk's office or from the planning department. I remind everyone that the building inspector is the zoning enforcement authority, and you are here this evening because the building inspector has determined that your proposed action is contrary to the city of Fall River zoning ordinances. Um, Normally, the first meeting of the year, we would have the election of offices, but because we did not put it on the agenda, uh, we will have that on the February meeting. Uh, okay. Um, we will take um, thereafter, so now we're going to proceed with the agenda, however, because agenda item number three uh, seems to require additional time, both for the applicant's presentation and public comment and support and in opposition, I would ask the board to consider that petition as the last item we do this evening. So moved. Okay. Yes? Yes. Finally, uh, the new charter provides for citizen input on zoning board specific matters at the end of the meeting. A sign up sheet is on the table in the back of the room and if anyone wants to sign up, they can put their name and we'll deal with it after we're done with the agenda items. Are there any questions before I begin? We'll start with agenda item 01, James Valancourt, here of David J. Megna Esquire, 
4011 North Main Street, lot X323. This is a variance request to demolish the existing structure and construct eight duplex houses for a total of 16 units. Waiving requirements in the BL district, lot size 101,041 plus or minus square feet. This matter was taken from our November 15, 2018 meeting. Good evening, Attorney Megna. Identify yourself for the record, please. Sure, Attorney David Megna, uh, 3129 County Street, Somerset, Mass., representing the petitioner. And with me is uh, Alex Gardetsky, the engineer for the, who developed the plan for the balance costs. And Mr. Chairman, uh, this is a continuation of a previous meeting. If, if uh, not everybody was, on the, was here the night that we were here last time, but um, I think it was important to have the engineer here. There were a lot of technical questions onto the plan, and that's why you know, Mr. Gardetsky is here, and I, I know that David, he's... David, yes. uh, who, who was on the original, who's here? Is John Frank here? Greg was here. John Frank was here. And John and Greg Brigham. Correct. Okay. Correct. So that being said, um, I, don't, I don't think you have you know you don't have enough to go forward. The original members still have to have to be here. That that was the original presentation. Okay. Because um, I think we took evidence that I we asked you to come back with the revised plan. And it was uh, Greg that had a lot of requests. And it was, was it was it Greg and I think it was John. I know Carolyn and I went through, and there was the issue that Alex had to redo the plan to deal with that parking issue. Correct. So, I th has, when did you originally file? Well, so here's my question. We can put it on for the February meeting, but I need a written waiver that we can get it there because the board can't act with only three members that can listen to it. Sure. Well, if that's the case, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's obviously that's what we have to do, and that's uh, that's our request yes. is to continue to continue to the right, next so meeting. We have, can you just can you put it in writing that you hereby waive your rights? Uh, I'll do that, uh, and, I'll and, and we can put it on. You agree to the February meeting without sure prejudice. Oh, Thank you. No. Yeah, that was good. That was good. Okay. Mr. Chairman, what I'll do is, uh, do you want me to just write it and just hand it back? That, that, that would be fine. That would be fine. Thank okay. you. And that would be no problem. Sure. Thank you for coming this evening. Okay. So, My pleasure. And what happens if we have a similar situation at the next meeting? Then you continue it again until you get a board that you can vote on, or you because withdraw we the application and you resubmit it. Yeah, no, wait, yeah, somebody yeah. brilliant will be here with John Frank to be here. You have at least the four, at least four of the five members that will be here. Thank you. Huh? No, I think we can't. Who's going to vote? The three. To continue. We can vote to continue. Okay, so we have a motion to continue to the February meeting. Move that we continue the February meeting. Second. Agenda item number one, Stephen Holbrook, care of 1111, 355 Bell Rock Road, lot W 2017. This is a special permit request to increase previously granted dwelling size of 28 by 36 to 26 by 40, waiving requirements in an R80 district lot size 30,432 plus or minus square feet. Chairman, members of the board, Attorney Mark L. Levin, 138 Rock Street, 4 of Massachusetts. I'm here today representing Stephen Holbrook. You can still speak. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm swearing you in. <clears throat> okay. Uh, my client received a variance to subdivide property uh, back in 2012. And at that time, he would plan to uh, buy a modular home that was 28 by 36. Uh, unfortunately, my client uh, did not have the funds to immediately go ahead and build this. He actually did do the uh, conveyances pursuant to the variance, but the building inspectors uh, agreed, and I agree with them, that we specifically said what the size of the house was and the sideline and setback requirements. Why we did that, I don't know, but we did at that time, and the problem is now my client is at the position to um, construct the house or put the modular home on and we've found out that they do not make a a uh, 36 uh, length house it, it is a 40 foot length house when you are buying this type of a product so we're looking to have the, the house set back it, it's actually going to be instead of uh, to say 20 
8 by 36, they make a 26 by 40. So we're asking that 40 the length of feet. That's right. That's yeah. all it is. Uh, and we were do, asking do, that I'm the. To, I've been trying to determine, and I couldn't really read it, but are the same side yards, are they still in effect? The north side will have to go to 89 feet. That's the only one that would have to change. We'd make that four feet smaller. So from 93 down to 89. 89. Okay. And other than that, those other dimensions remain. No problem. Yeah. I, I just want to. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Holbrook, I like seeing you and seeing your attorney. My question is, I don't want to see you back because you, have to, you need another foot this way or that way. No. So I, are you certain that those are the dimensions? Yeah. No, that'll be fine. We kept it the same. The only difference was the four foot difference. Technically. The, 30, the 26 by 40 is 32, sque 32 square feet bigger than 28 by 36, you know, the size of a sheet of plywood, you know. That's but unfortunately, this is what they make. Him. Yeah. Okay. Members of the board, any questions? Is yeah, there anyone? Following up on your, your question, Go ahead. There, are there no decks or other things that would expand that beyond? Not on the no. sides. Okay. No. No. Just well, no, 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 no. Sure. Listen, I just want to make sure because you're not showing it and we're saying that the minimum, the south side yard is 65 feet. Correct. You're, correct. Not going to, you're not going to encroach in that with a budget no. deck or no. anything. No, no. Okay. All right. No, no thank just, you. I'm I appreciate to be, I'm that. Trying. <laughs> yeah. And again, my position is that this is insubstantial and it's not more harmful to the neighborhood than what the permitted use is. Okay. Is there anyone here in favor of this petition? Is there anyone here opposed to this petition? Members of the board, can I get a motion to grant, motion to deny? Motion to grant. Motion to grant by Jim Corkins. Do I have a second? Second, second by Dan Dupier. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? One, two, three, four. Okay, so unanimous vote in favor. You can hold that, but you have to wait for the time period to pass, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, five period. days. Oh, oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. But it's great. So it was granted with the same conditions, except it was 89 instead of 90. That's correct. Ex exactly. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So those are going to be the conditions. Okay. All right. Agenda item number two: Ma Maxwell C. Rosen, care of Jeffrey Medeiros, Esquire, um, three, 384, 390 Rich Street, Lot G9-8. This is a variance request to subdivide the property to two lots, leaving one three-family dwelling on each lot, waiving requirements in an A3 district. Lot size is 3,398 plus or minus square feet, 3,377 plus or minus square feet. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Good evening, Mr. Right Chairman, here. members of the board, um, Mr. Roth. My name is Attorney Jeffrey Medeiros with a law office located at 277 Bedford Street in the city of Fall River. I represent the petitioner, Maxwell C. Rosa. Uh, Mr. Rosa sends his apologies, but he's a government contractor and he could not make it here to this evening's meeting. What he proposes is to, as you just stated, to subdivide the property, uh, leaving two buildings, 384 and, 38, uh, and 390 uh, Ridge Street, leaving uh, one three-family building on one lot, leaving another three-family building on the other lot, and creating lot sizes 3,398 square feet and the other one 3,377 square feet. These were buildings that were built pre-zoning, their pre-existing non-conforming uses. Um, it, if the uh, board sees fit to allow uh, the subdivision, it would not be uh, detrimental to the uh, area the way it is now. Uh, he's going to create one new parking place. Currently, right now, there is all on-street parking. Uh, so that parking space will be for the back, the back house, lot number two. Lot number two, that singular new parking that is, place. That is correct. Um, right now, it's all... Lot number one has no off-street parking. Currently, they have no off-street right parking now, as no it is. there's no off-street parking at all for anything. That is correct. So... Um, if you look at the uh, drawing, you can see that uh, there's stairways that go towards the back. Uh, the topography of the land is sloping towards Ridge Street. There's retaining walls on the side of the new parking, or there will be retaining walls on the side of the new parking area. There's currently stairs that go to the back building now. Uh, so it's just the new lot line that would be created. Um, the 
area itself, as you can see, uh, Ridge Street and Whipple Street, there's multifamily units and three family units on both sides. Uh, there's multis in the back, uh, and um, the a la is shown as a multi. So the house, the lot on the side also has two multifamily dwellings on one lot, and the others are singular multifamily dwellings. So uh, with that, uh, if the board approves it, it will not be a, a substantial detriment to the neighborhood as well. It's, it's not going to be a literal enforcement of the zoning ordinance will not uh, be a, an issue. Attorney Medeiros, why did you bring it as a variance instead of a special permit? Uh, when I talked to the building inspector, he said that it would be better for a variance. I wanted to go with a special permit. So, but, you know, a special but permit just, is, yes, the, the um, no, no, I'm just, I, I just refer you to, to our ordinance because my research brought me back to 1900 when these two houses were built. That is correct. the singular lot. And under Article 5, non-conforming uses, lots, and structures, Section 86-423, subsection B, says the Zoning Board of Appeals may grant a special permit for the division of a single lot. Uh, of record uh, containing two or more residential dwellings existing uh, continuously since 1954. Now, I just I wanted, if you had something that I was missing, I No, no, what it's, it was. it's basically when I talked to the building inspector, that's, that's why. Okay. But, um, you know, okay. if. So we have this unique shaped lot, well, uh, rectangular shaped lot, two buildings on it, and you're coming forward with a variance. Um, I don't know what the board. I, is there any intention of putting any fencing or anything up? Because I really don't. For for safety reasons, I have recommended to my client that that would not be uh, advisable. Okay, because access, because I'm very that is concerned correct. about public once safety. Those, once that line goes, especially for the fire department. That's correct. And I've already advised my client of that so fact. So if the board puts those conditions on, that doesn't impede you in any way. Now, on that ridge street, when I look, they're going to be able to cut in because I think there's a little ridge there on that sidewalk, isn't it? They're going to go up and in. That is correct. And my client has already uh, talked to the engineering with regard to uh, separating the utilities. Well, we haven't gotten to that, but we should be. I would expect the board to say that if we grant the variance, there would be separate utilities, an affidavit recorded at the Registry of Deeds, uh, verifying or attesting to the fact that that has happened. Okay. Is there anything else, Mr. Director? In addition to the a affidavit, um, which is a standard that the board does in this type of case, um, since it appears to be new utilities, I I'd like a specific requirement that a utility as built plan be required. Um, you know, in this day and age, it's much easier in the, to, uh, when they are separated, to have those specific as built plans done. So, if there's any issues later on, at least they can refer to a plan. Correct. And then the only other issue I have, uh, the only thing I, I have is um, depending on what you do due to topography and ledge and, and whatnot, you, you, you may need some easements, but, and, and, and that's something you're going to, and, and Encounter yeah. anyway, and you're going to encounter that. I'm just kind of that's kind of a heads up is is that I'd be willing to bet you you're going to have I've already I've already have some sort of easements on this because the way the utilities are going to run, they're going to they're eventually so. But that would be part of the ASBO plan and requirement of community <coughs> utilities. I'm pretty sure. I've notified my client to the fact that there's probably going to be easements for the gas lines, water lines, sewer lines, and such. But they will be separate. Yeah, that is correct. Okay. Members of the board, I didn't mean to keep on to. Is there any questions by the members of the board? Is there anyone here in favor of this petition? Is there anyone here opposed to this petition? Okay. <coughs> okay a motion to grant, motion to deny. Motion to grant by Dan. Do I have a second? Dan, yours is to grant with those conditions that we talked about. Okay. <coughs> second. second by Carol. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Two, three, four, five. So the petition is granted with those conditions, the express conditions being utility as built. Uh, utilities have to be separated after they were recorded as registry of deeds. Um, and do we want e is that with easements? The easements being made part of the file? We don't need that. Uh, no, the, so the as utility built. as built and the separate utilities. And no fences. And no fences. Yep. 
Okay. So that's what was voted on. That's what's granted. Unanimous vote, five to zero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Thank you. So, it's, well, so instead of taking agenda item number three, we're taking number four. Uh, so that's going to be AEG Realty LLC, Scott Adams, care of Peter Salino. Peter's not here, but Uncle John Salino is here. <laughs> 825 New Boston Road, Lot 1041. It's a variance request to convert or rebuild the existing professional office building to a proposed professional office building and or retail operation with 2,035 plus or minus square feet of floor area, waiving requirements in a G district. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and Mr. Roth. For the record, my name is John Solino. As some people call my office, say I'm the old Salino. They want the young Salino. I'm the old one. Um, I'm here tonight with the petitioner, Scott Adams, from AGG Realty, LLC. Um, this request that's before you, just a little bit of background, this lot has been subject to variances dating back to uh, 1982. It was the first one that was granted to allow Francis Harrington to convert that building into a, an insurance office. And it remained an insurance office up until Mr. Harrington's death in 2006. And thereafter, there were further variances granted in 2008 and 9, I believe it was, for um, the, a credit union to operate. There was a real estate office. There's a financial planner there. And now Mr. Adams is seeking to renovate, re reconstruct, whatever he will explain that to you. Mr. Adams. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Again, my name is Scott Adams. I'm a professional engineer in the states of Mass, Rhode Island, and New York. I am one of the owners and principals of Advanced Engineering as well as AG Realty. Uh, we have entered into an agreement with Southern Mass Credit Union to purchase this property. Um, they originally, as was discussed, intended to knock down the building and create one of their branch offices with a drive through and a drive-up ATM. My understanding is through to a, due to a merger of banks, they no longer have the need for that, so right now it's only been being used as a drive-up ATM. Um, they've looked at selling it to previous members of, of the, you know, re residents or tenants, rather, of the space, uh, but that is, you know, not going through. So the property currently is at the intersection of Oak Grove Avenue and New Boston Road. It's approximately 11,800 square feet, which represents, it was originally a double lot, an original lotting plan to this subdivision, um, but the, the building more or less situates straddles that line. Uh, it's approximately 2,035 square feet in its current condition, and majority of the property is actually um, impervious. There's only a couple of small little uh, landscape areas as shown. <coughs> Just as a quick kind of reminder to, the, to some of the board members that were here previously, this is what was presented by the credit unit to the board, which is basically squaring off the building, making a roughly 2,000 square foot box, and, and having a drive-through lane and a drive-up ATM that abuts the ab abutting uh, residential property owner. Uh, that's not what you're proposing. No. That is not what I'm proposing. I'm just right. kind of so showing. Don't confuse yep. <laughs> that, that's what was previously approved. So. This is what we're currently proposing. Um, and just to back up for, for two seconds, the reason we're kind of proposing this is we've done a lot of, as much research as we can on the existing facility, and it's in quite disrepair. My belief is that because the bank thought that they were going to knock it down and build a credit union, they have not been adequately maintaining the building. Uh, so we did a lot of the structural research for the building. It probably needs about $75,000 worth of repair to structural modifications to the flooring members and, and the floor joists, et cetera, and the beams supporting it. And that only represents about half of what they can see. So they're basically telling us it could be, definitely be more than that. So now we start approaching, as I'm sure you know, about 50% of the value of the building, which could trigger us having to come in front of you folks anyway um, to maintain the, the pre-existing approvals you know, for, for the building. So we wanted to make sure that before we purchased it, we secured the ability to repair the structure and or replace the structure in kind in its same location. Um, so that, that's so kind of getting rid of that yep. older structure, putting a 21st century building with all the amenities on the same floor. Correct. And, and while we looked at it, obviously we're in the industry, site development uh, industry, so we looked at how can we make this better as well. Right now there's three curb cuts. There's one along Ocean Grove, Oak, um, Oak Grove, Grove Avenue. Avenue. There's one right at the intersection 
and then there's one a little bit further away. As part of our site plan approval process, we were looking to actually close up this curb cut that's closest to the intersection, which would greatly improve um, you know, turning movements at that intersection. And it would also allow us to get a couple of additional parking spaces, which would make the site conforming for parking as well. So the curb cut on Oak Grove Avenue will remain yes. the first one on well, the yeah, Boston. Uh, one furthest east will remain because you've got that right. uh, parking lot, but the other one will be eliminated and curb will be put back in. Correct, and that would allow us to expand on the, the landscaping and that location, add a couple of additional parking spaces, and by keeping this, we're basically keeping our fire access around the building, which the fire department is going to want as well. So we're actually decreasing the impervious area on the site by approximately 670 square feet, which would then decrease you know, runoff from, from the property as well and make the site more conforming than it, than it currently is. We would actually increase the setbacks by squaring off the building right now. It follows the uh, public uh, right away. Is the building going to be less square footage, the, the footprint, or is it going to be the exact same? It's about 35 square feet less. All right, so you're not expanding it. You're no. keeping it within the confines or less. Correct. OK. And we would obviously be removing the drive-through lanes, so we'd be increasing technically the setbacks on that side. The building um, setback more or less is the same, if you will, but the canopy that was, that was being previously pr approved would be removed. So therefore, we're actually increasing the setbacks. Um, the only thing that they did as part of their previous approvals was they constructed the sign. The sign for the illumination and the clock, as I remember, you got a they got a variance to right. that. Mm -hmm. But that's gone. That's not going to be there anymore. The sign will actually still be there. It's actually in the landscaped area. I'm sure we're. Are you going to keep the my sign? My firm has no interest necessarily in, in keeping an illuminated sign because we, we don't anticipate that. Well, let's need, talk about signage. It's Please. currently there now. Are you going to use the sign? We are going to use the sign okay. for signage, but I'm not sure we need a clock. No, I'm not. not <laughs> for, I'm just asking because if you've got the signage, then you're going to use what's there. If you need additional signage, then it will be in accordance with, the, with, with our ordinance about signs in a G district. Nope. We, we will so use what's there. No additional signage. Okay. <coughs> That's it? That is it. Members of the board, any questions? Is there anyone? No? I mean, it's kind of no. straightforward. Does Anyone here in favor of this petition? Anyone here opposed to this petition? Uh, Director of Planning, any questions? Site the only thing is, this? Um, we would request that the board require um, site plan review for this. We really kind of want to look at the, um, the site layout, make sure the screening. Um, a vast majority of what they're doing, they've already done. Uh, closing off that entrance is really good. The only, I think one of the things that we would want to look at through site plan review is a, a dry well for the uh, roof uh, gutters. Uh, that's that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, but uh, we want the ability to look at the site plan review, so that would be a request uh, from the planning department to make that a decision. Do we want condition, should the board consider a condition that the curbing be replaced on the <coughs> western part? I do well. You can say in conformance, in 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 substantial conformance to the plan that was presented. That that way, it gives the it gives the site plan review committee some guidance. Yeah. Is that good? Can you work with that? Yeah, I, I guess my only concern is that it's kind of open ended um, with respect to me purchasing the property. Um, Larry to spend you know hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and not necessarily have something that I can actually build yet. Um, what if it did, for some reason if it came back unfavorable by the site plan board? It is a different board group than you, so there's different. Um, yeah, but with this board, if we if the board grants you permission to knock it down, put the new building up, then that's the land use. The other stuff is uh, the only issue that I was asking is about whether or not because I want to <coughs> getting rid of that curb cut, but sure. I would like a piece of curb in there. Yeah, I'd have no problem that I have no problem. But with I that think the review I'm, because it's a new building. Mm -hmm. um, Site plan review is probably a good idea, but that's up to the board members if they want to make that a condition. Okay, so if that's what we've got. Uh, I asked anyone in favor, anyone opposed? Right. Uh, okay, so do we have a motion to grant with conditions, motion to deny? What do you want to do? Move approval with the uh, condition being uh, replacement of curb as presented and uh, site plan. That's it. Okay, so do we have a second on that motion? I'm second. Second by Carolyn. Any discussion on the motion? <coughs> All those in favor? 
oppose none. So that petition is granted with those conditions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And you could submit your site plan for review prior to purchasing it if they allowed you to. Yeah, absolutely. I'm definitely going to push push for that since it is a condition of the board. I think it's within yep. within purview for us. Yeah, exactly. Thank, Thank you. you. Good. Agenda item number three, co-part of Connecticut Ned. Inc. Care of 1111 New Street Lot T21 variance request to allow wholesale and retail sale and auction of used, damaged, and undamaged operable and inoperable automobiles and trucks or other vehicles, trailers, boats, and construction farm equipment and machinery with accessory office, temporary inventory storage, shipping, receiving, and customer parking provided in the WTOD district lot size, 2,181,433 plus or minus square feet. Chairman, members of the board, Mark Levin, uh, attorney at law, 138 Rock Street, Forever, Massachusetts. I'm here tonight representing the petitioner, uh, Copart of Connecticut, Inc. Uh, I am here with representatives of Copart. I have one that will be available to speak, one that will be available to ask questions. I have the LSP uh, who has written up the report that we submitted to you, and I also have the attorney that uh, did the regulatory uh, review of the title when they purchased it, and I have the principal of the current owner of the property if there are questions there. Um, if I start off to say that this is the unique piece of property in this district, it's probably an understatement. It's probably the unique piece of property in the city of Fall River. This property is bounded by the Taunton River, most part, at least two sides, by New Street, which is basically where the railway comes through, and down by Route 79. That's really what this lot is. It contains, as you see, a few acres of land, a little over 50 acres of land. This is probably the most controversial piece of property that has been out in Fall River in 10 years. <laughs> and that, that's not an understatement. This was a site where at one point an LNG uh, facility was going to be uh, placed on it. But it is the old terminals that had been there since the 1900s. Uh, eventually, to Shell Oil was the last terminal owner that operated it. I argue that under the WOT division, the use book, not the definitions, which I say are really for an accessory use, but the use book that under automobile related uses, it permits a parking lot, private and public garages, and parking structures other than those that would be for accessory use to a principal. So this is a parking lot. It could have been a public parking lot that someone built just to have people come in and park their cars. It could have been a garage for people to have parking. It's not an accessory use that just for the people that were there. Otherwise, you'd never have such a thing as a garage in the city of Forever if you looked at the definition on the page 14 of what a parking garage or space is because that says you have to use it. Obviously, if I build a parking garage in the city for river, not everyone that parks their car is going to be working in that garage and being there. So this sets forth a use that is separate in the pot than just the definition. That's my argument. Copot, as you'll hear, and I'll tell you, is a company that basically was formed years ago to satisfy the insurance industry. There was a uh, it was a hurricane that originally happened down somewhere in North Carolina. Insurance company had to take all these cars that had been underwater, put them someplace. They found a guy that had some land, had a garage, parked them there. Their insurance company sold those cars out somewhere. These cars, although the definition of what we're asking for just takes care of the broad spec of everything just because we never know what type of car that comes in. If it's a car that is a junk, it doesn't come here. They resell cars. 
And in fact, what the difference here and where I argue that this does fall within this use is the fact that we are having sales of these cars. And that poses an issue. They get a class two license. It's not a junk license. These cars are used cars. They come in and they come out. They don't make money unless they sell these things. But they don't sell anything on site. They have 40 to 50 people that'll be here that'll move the cars on site. They'll take information, concern the cars. They input it. They'll, they're going to use the existing office that's there. They're going to input into the system. It goes down to their parent company in Dallas. Dallas puts this on, on the cloud for internet throughout the world because they have 200 facilities throughout the world and these cars get sold. When Houston had the hurricane, they had 50,000 cars were put on the NASTEC track. Those cars were all sold. Now, maybe they weren't sold to people in this country. They might have been sold overseas because someone may not mind the musty smell that might have occurred from the water damage, but they get sold. These cars are not technically demolished cars. It's not a junkyard. So I argue that the fact that no one comes on site other than the employees, they're delivered, they're parked there, they get auctioned, and they get taken off. No one comes on site, no one looks at the car, no one pays for it on at the site. There's really no sales occurring there. So my argument is you have a parking lot incidental to an online site that sells those somewhere else in the cloud. But that's where I have to come here for the variance because that is our concern whether or not this does not conform to it. So first, I'll argue that it does conform and that the incidental sale that doesn't occur here but elsewhere but the car just gets taken off is no different than if I were driving my car onto this property and then eventually driving it off. No one will know, or I sell my car to someone else, I pick it up. So that's my first argument. So whether or not you agree to that, that's up to you. The alternative is to determine whether or not this property has such topographical soil conditions that relate to a hardship in that the differences of what the use is and with the differences that the zoning allows is insubstantial and has no different impact than had it been a parking lot for the public to come in there. In fact, I will tell you it would have less impact because you're not going to have cars coming in and out all day long if it was a regular parking lot. That flow does not happen. This property is regulated, restricted, and will be so for the next 20 or 30, 40 years. In fact, it will be restricted forever because there's only so much work being done on the property by Shell. First, we have the waterfront. Now, you'd say, well, we could have some waterfront business and everything. That would be zoning. Well, yes, they have to comply with the Chapter 91 license. The problem is the reason why there's a 700 and some foot dock that goes out that's barely a dock anymore and that only has pipes there that ran to bring flow of oil or gas is because there's no water close to this property. You can't get in there with a ship. I, mean, I could probably get my little boat in there, but I can't get a ship in there. They come out to the big dock and they pump out because there's no water there. So the next thing is, well, why don't you dredge? Can't judge. As you've seen by the documentation I sent you before and the deed restrictions, the DEP restrictions, and the LSP's restrictions, they can't do any dredging out here because they're afraid they'll release contaminations from the site that has happened for many years. Now, they've taken, from what I've told, uh, about 1.6 million gallons of materials out of here since 1970. Unfortunately, that's only a little portion of what will be there. The other problem you have is we have <coughs> nine oil tanks on here. Those are special structures. There really isn't much else you can do under your zoning bylaws that I could use those nine tanks with oil. Those will go away. I would assume 
that condition of the property, as blighted as it is, it's not kept up as much anymore. People do dispose of things on the property that are not my clients or the owners. And these tanks will go away. They'll be removed. You won't have that site anymore. I drive by that every morning on the way to work on 79 coming into Fall River. I just see this stuff and just ugly. The rest of the land really doesn't get much touched. It's going to be leveled out. And the reason, the reason why is contamination. If you read the restrictions, and you've seen the LSP report, there isn't much you can put on this property. The limitations of this are such that it is <coughs> impractical and economically infeasible to do so, and that's a criteria for a hardship that's related to the land that the law allows you to have a variance for. You can do something with a variance, or you never have a variance if you couldn't find some reason to allow something else to be used on a property that has purposeful use. This property has no productivity right now. It's vacant. It's empty. Shell is pumping out materials. They have no need to take those tanks down at this point in time or the other materials. And they will be pumping out of this property for the next 20, 30, 40 years. If you read the LSC report and the restrictions, what DEP is allowed, DEP is allowing or requiring Shell to take out enough level of the property that does not affect the groundwater. Yet the restrictions are no will they be able to get to the groundwater here, no will be able to dig on this property, and you can't put a permanent building on that. The reason why you can't put a permanent building? Because as Shell migrates through the property to take out the contamination, they have to get to that location where that property is. So Copot that has a parking lot that puts some pavement down, moves their cars, they dig up, they're not concerned really about the material, the, the, the asphalt being dug up. Shell then starts working in that area. So what you now have is an area that really has so much limited use to what the zoning would permit that the closest thing you have is actually a parking lot under this under your zoning bylaws. And I'm saying it's not substantial. The difference of having the cars parked there or having cars coming in and out all day long than having them being there for a week or two and they get taken out of the place. Now part of the, and not part of your real presentation, but just to let you know what other benefits are, one of the things when we approached the city on this where it became something would be interested in some other projects that have been there, Copart has offered to the city of Full River a, uh, a host agreement where for every car they sell, they will pay $4 a car. They've already put this in writing. It's with the Corporation Council for their approval if this happens. Further, Copart will maintain the property they put a fence, and you saw in your um, the slide presentations, they actually have their own patented fence. And Donald Trump has not called them yet for it, but it's a real nice fence. And what they do is they rip-wrap the entire thing. So people looking out, people saying, oh, we're going to come up the water and you're going to see all these. No one's going to see anything. In fact, most of the employees they hire are people that work there at night to protect the property to make sure no one gets into the property. Cars not disassembled, the cars are whole, the cars get sold. Now, looking at the the property itself, because you can't put more buildings, because we have these nine oil tanks, they're not useful other than to being an oil tank, and that's not <coughs> under the zoning permit to do so. Those will go down. We won't have structures. That is an effect. Now, yes, the owner of the property, who's here, he knew what he was buying. Colpot understands what it is. They know what they're buying, but they're only going to buy it if they can use this property. To have it sit here and not be able to use because there really isn't anything under the zoning bylaws that you can say I can use. They will never in the entire world ever have a recreational use of this property. It's restricted forever. Shell is not going to reclaim the property that can be used and be soiled, removed. You can't have daycares. You can't have housing. 
you can't have residential use. You can't have public access generally. <coughs> right now, this gives the city the ability to let the continual cleanup to happen, to turn this property into possibly the most productive property in a small location where the taxes will go up from the abatement that was given because of the hardship with the land to, I won't put my client's foot in it, but five to ten times as much as you're collecting now, plus you'll get jobs out of it, plus you'll get a, uh, a, a host agreement to pay them. One of the other things you'll be assured, no one will ever come back here for LNG. No one will come back here for some type of gas or coal or oil type of provisions that will go on this property. This property would be cleaned. It will have a value. Yes, coal pot may stay here forever and be a great partner for the city of forever. It may leave. And at that point, when it's cleaned up enough, it may be able to be used for something else. Don't know what yet because it's so restricted. But it may be able to use. But right now, it's economically, it's impractical to use it for anything that the zoning would permit. We're stuck. I mean, it really comes down to it. The best thing that this could be used, if you're going to use it again, is to have another oil tank farm or an LNG company or gas company. No one's asking for that. We're eliminating that. In fact, the, the owner has already put as part of his P&S that there'll be a restriction, and that's already been sent to the uh, Corporation Council, that this property would not be used to store any hazardous waste or materials on the property in perpetual to the benefit of the city. The city would be the only one to release that, and that's already with the Corporation Council. Now, my feeling is, is that once you have a remediation, uh, you got something that gives you a better use of this property someday. But right now, the only use is something that someone can do that does not have the effect of causing more harm to the neighborhood and reducing the risk to other people. We're not going to have the public come on the property. They won't have that risk that sits there now where people do encroach on the thing. They don't have lights at night. This place is dark at night. It's not going to interfere with anyone that does have any residential property nearby. It, they keep it like a little compound. They, 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 I, I was talking to one of the people in Texas before, and he says, you know, when some graffiti goes on, the next day it's gone. They have enough people. That's what they do. That's what they're doing. They, they don't make money, and these cars are there. Like I said, they get a Class 2 license. It's not a junk car, as people say. Are there regulations? In fact, this property probably is the most regulated property you'll have in the city of Fall River. You'll have 91 requirements. Not that Copot is going to use that area where 91 is about five acres, but there are requirements to make sure that the public access stays there. And once it's cleaned, yes, maybe that will be something that Copot will have to make sure that stays available for them. They have regulatory for conservation. There are several conservation orders out there that right now there's a lawsuit with conservation where the owner was going to put in uh, urban fill and decided that this is something that came to him that's better. It eliminate the need or the want or the, the ability of not having that there on the property was so something that is permitted just through the area that they were contending. So that lawsuit goes away for the city too. You'll have a useful product, uh, a productive piece of property. Uh, there won't be any more buildings on the property. You'll have the tanks go down. Uh, it's clear that the deviation, if you believe that this is not a parking lot or there are sales coming for it, the deviation for what is going to be here is insubstantial. It's not going to affect the neighborhood. It doesn't hurt them. They won't know other than a car carry may come in or a car drive off. Uh, I, I told some of the people before a little antidote, and I'll tell you, I had an accident in Dece on December 1st. I was going out to dinner with my wife for her birthday, I'm driving on the highway, an unregistered, unlicensed deer ran out in front of me, hit me, took off, never gave me this insurance info. I didn't think it was that bad. I swerved, got hit, just on the light side. I got into the left lane when I swerved, and I get the right side where I 
single indicator didn't work. So I says, oh, okay, it's gonna cost me a couple hundred bucks because I stupid deal. Get to the restaurant, I look out front, all the plastic stuff's gone, the grill's gone, the headlights works, but the plastic's gone, the fog light's missing, and the indicator light is broken. So it wasn't a great night. So the next day, we had to go to New York. I drive the car to New York, it's perfectly drivable. Drove back, drove it to the auto body shop. The end of the week, I get a phone call. Insurance company, Mr. Levin, you have your title? Says, yeah, why? Oh, we're gonna send you a FedEx to have you send it to us. What are you talking about? I said, well, we're not gonna fix it. What do you mean not gonna fix it? Car drives fine, just a little bit. I drove it to New York and back. So, oh, $5,000 worth of parts. You can't get aftermarket parts for this car. It's all plastic, it comes from the company. It's only the fenders and stuff we can get, and there's nothing wrong with the fenders. It's just the plastic crap in the lights, like 1500 bucks. So my car gets bought. Who gets to take it? Copart. It gets actually, my car goes up to Bellingham, and three days later I'm told by the car dealer, because he's looking at the auction site, my car sold off in three days. And they have the site, and that's what they do. They have class two licenses all over. Now, was my car damaged? Yeah, it was damaged. It was still drivable. I drove it, but that was considered an inoperable damaged car, and the insurance company put a sal uh, uh, what do you call it, sticker on it, a, uh, salvage. a s salvage <laughs> mocking on the ticket. <clears throat> so these are the type of vehicles they have. They don't bring junk because they can't sell junk. They need to sell this. This is the only way they make money. Uh, my, my request is obviously that uh, you find that owing to the uh, conditions of the property, the soil, the structures on the property, that this is such that allows the land and affects that land that is unique to this neighborhood, to this district, obviously. That the literal enforcement of your zoning board ordinance not be enforced that the leniency to have someone make this productive that can't be used for anything else per se under that under your zoning bylaws be permitted and that not doing so causes a financial hardship by having this impractical and unfeasible to use it economically at this point in time and that the relief really isn't going to nullify your zoning bylaws you allow a parking lot yeah, you don't allow sales, but this, these type of sales are not the typical sales that we have on the boulevard where people are coming in, looking at the cars and driving them around, bringing them back. <coughs> these are on the internet. This is in the cloud. Um, I'm going to let, now I'll relieve myself, and I'm going to let Copot explain to you who they are, what they do, so you'll have a better feel. Again, Lisa will tell you that. I know, but before you do that, let me ask oh, you oh, sure. a question. If you don't mind. Oh, no, please. Thank and I have, like I said, I have the experts. Okay. You have questions. So let's, let's talk about what what our grid provides for, what the uses provide for. Under the automotive-related uses, we say no automotive sales, indoor or outdoor. You can't do it in the WTO industry. You can't do automotive repair. You can't do gasoline filling stations. You can't do auto paint or body shops. You can't have a car wash. You get to your argument about the parking lot, then you get down a G lot for stowed, towed vehicles. Again, a prohibited use in the area. So the automotive stuff seems to be extremely prohibitive, except for the parking lot, private and public garages, and parking structures other than those provided as an accessory use to the principal use being conducted on the lot. Our definition of parking lots, I think it distinguishes between residential and commercial, if you go to the, if you go to the definition of the Bible. So then you get to all the other uses that could happen. Uh, so you can have multifamily dwellings and based on what your representation about the conditions that are there and you provided us, it looks like residential use isn't really going to happen there in this, in my Ever. lifetime. In my right. lifetime. Anyway. Ever. Uh, but you could have a church or religious uh, purpose and or any exempt use. You could have a public, private, religious, or other nonprofit school. Um, whether you're not going to put kids there or not, I don't know. But maybe they're going to study environmental cleanups. Uh, you could have a club or a lodge, except one whose chief activity is customarily carried on as a business. Um, that's not allowed. You can have a bicycle and pedestrian path, 
landscape, pedestrian, parks, and plazas. You could have a library or museum. You could have legalized gambling facility. I'm getting close to that, I think. Commercial recreational facility, outdoor, including stadiums, athletic facilities, and convention complexes. You could have commercial recreational facility indoor, including stadiums, athletic facilities, and convention complexes. You could have a, uh, municipal use and municipal facilities. You could have retail operation with 5,000 square feet or less of gross floor area per <coughs> establishment. Retail operation with greater than 5,000 square feet. You could have a service business. You could have a restaurant. You could have, with a special permit, a bar, saloon, or other establishment where alcoholic beverages are sold and consumed, but which is not licensed to prepare or serve food. Special permit, you can have a veterinary establishment, pet shop, or similar establishments. You can have a hotel or motel on the water there. Uh, you can have a bank or other monetary institution, ATMs. You could have a theater, auditorium, museum, or other establishment offering recreation to the general public. Uh, we talked about that. You can have a radio or television studio, special permit radio or television transmission stations. You could have an intermodal transportation facilities, including but not limited to bus and or railroad uh, passenger terminals. Uh, yes. You could have my eyesight here. <laughs> business or professional office, telephone answering service call center. You could have an information and information processing data or collection and data storage recording keeping. You could have water dependent use, fish and seafood receiving, handling storage and shipping, boat building and repair, marinas, shipping, passenger and cargo terminals receiving <coughs> and berthing. Uh, you could have artist lofts or art use, culinary arts, retail sales of art, including gift and specialty shops. Um, let's see what else. Cabinet and, ca I would, yeah, cabinet and cabinetry shops, studios for artists and craft people. And you can have visual and performing art space, including but not limited to uh, exhibition and concert halls, galleries and stage and screen theaters. So you've got lots of things other that you can use other than, no, no, let me keep going. So you've got, you've got yes. some other uses other than you can't use it for this is the only use you can No, 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 no. I'm saying right. it's impractical or feasible. I, I, got, no, no, I got the argument, but I just wanted to be clear yes. that there were other uses under, oh. it wasn't just excluded that no, no, this no, is no. all I can do. No. The other question that I have, and I, I'm trying to get my head around, Copop buys it, but Shell Oil Company is still dealing with things. So is it a joint venture or are they? Co Shell Oil has control. They're a third kind of control that the state of Massachusetts gave the right to recover and is responsible. Copot, to use it, has to get the LSAP, the LSP, the LSP to prove where they put hot top if they move any soil. So Shell is still going to be involved with this property? Forever. Well, they're the no, no, multi billion I got, I got dollar company. They're the one, they're the no one else could. Help. No one else could afford to do anything with this property. That's the problem. I got, like I said, we have all these uses. That would be nice if one of them or some of them could be used. But if you can't put a building on, the I got property, it, Mark. But okay. Got, but what you've got is you've got Shell that did whatever they did to the property, causing the condition. It wasn't just Shell. It goes back to the 1900s. Yeah, I know. They're, they're, they're the I, last thing. I think in some of the stuff that I read, they they were held as being the primary responsible yeah, buyer. They were the last ones standing. Uh, so Copart knows what they're buying. They do. With, with all the issues there, um, and I, I'm just and Shell continues, but they're going to use this limited piece. Of uh, all right, but that's, won't, that's the existing. But that's the existing condition of the property right yeah. now. We won't be here when Shell is finished. No, no, I, I, I believe that. Truly. Uh, so, no, the, God, I'm sorry. I just, no, I just no, need no. to ask those questions because what I heard you say was just that there were a limited number of uses, but there's well, lots of uses. Limited uses that that can be done with this property because of its condition, not that. But we still it, have the automobile, and again, I'm trying to get my head around. <laughs> you're selling, but you're, you're claiming or you're presenting, your assertion is it's not automobile sales. And the next part of it is 
it sounds like it's more like a stowage lot than it is just a pop lot. Well, and I, I yes. understand the distinction, but I'm just telling you yes. where I'm trying to distinguish it and say it's not a storage lot, it's a parking lot. But when you tell me you're having car carriers bring stuff in, um, and I understand. Your, your analogy about your car, I don't know what that is. No, but I'm <laughs> saying is, <laughs> well, but it's a temporary transient I got it. place that comes in and out. And it's under, not and under our grid, it says no. I understand that. Well, that's why we're here. I know that's why. <laughs> so, but that, but this, but you, with there is not much that under as close as possible to what you allow that can really be done with this property. It's so limited. I mean, it's got all this lovely waterfront. Problem is, it's not deep. I mean, you can walk out halfway out to this end of the pier before you hit over your head. It's just so shallow and you can't dig it. it, it, it this, this property, like I said, if I ever had a unique piece of property to talk about, this, this is, is the one in Fort oh, River. No, There's I, no question in my I mind. Think it's a, for the intellectual curiosity of <laughs> and, zoning, I think it makes a yeah. good argument. The and I would love, I would love, because I remember my son was working on the LNG stuff when he was a kid here, when that was going on, and I would love to have seen the urban renewal plan for all these ideas they wanted to do with this possible could be done that can't be done. If you can't put a building on there to let children or people have contact to the property. If you can't, uh, well, you can't put a building on the property. It's really not much use to many people. The tanks aren't going to be used by anyone. Those come down. I mean, those. This is a. It's a blighted situation. They they're not using the tanks anymore. They are not they? using them now. I'm told they're they're finally emptied, yeah. and they're just they're just so sitting. So it's been there. a couple of years since any activity has. That been is correct. There. So, this is unique, unique property. It's a unique situation, and unfortunately. For the next 20, 30 years, the use is still going to be limited, and most of the uses you allow still will never be allowed to be used on this property based on that. And again, I, beside what Lisa will tell so about the company, but I do have uh, uh, the engineer, Tom, uh, 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 you Andrew. Yeah, but he's here if you have questions about that. I have a regulatory individual, and I have no person from COPA. But let, let Lisa tell you what. Uh, what goes on with uh, her company? Good evening. Um, my name is Lisa Doherty. I am, yes, regional manager for New England for Copart. Um, although Attorney Levin did a pretty good job explaining what we do, uh, hopefully try to um, explain a little bit about what we do and some misconceptions. Um, we're a Fortune 500 publicly traded company, international. Uh, we are an auto auction, strictly online. We have. Um, seven facilities in the New, Eng New England itself, three of which are in Massachusetts um, currently. Uh, primarily our customers are insurance companies, fleet companies, um, dealer vehicles, things like that. Literally we bring them in, we, auction we process titles, do paperwork, do all that kind of stuff, and sell them online. Carriers come in and pick them up. Carriers bring them in. Carriers bring them in, yep, and carriers pick them up. Correct. So when Attorney Levin said that sometimes people drive off, does people Sometimes they do drive, yep. Yep, sometimes they drive. More often than not, they're picked up by um, carriers. Okay. Just because it's easier and they contract well, to get more than one vehicle, usually at one time. What would be the traffic flow on an average day? Um, well, we don't really know how big, you know, how much this facility will will take away from our other facilities in Massachusetts, so it's kind of hard to determine. But on average, ten trucks a day, in and out, I would say is a is a good average. And that's just, I mean, until we know what the volume would be actually going in there, it's kind of a hard question for us to answer. How many cars do you think or vehicles would you still want to property? I don't know the answer to that. It, we, we currently have three facilities in Massachusetts, and our entire business is zip zone driven, so it goes closest yard logic based on the zip code. So it could potentially flow through this yard, 14,000 cars a year, not sit, not in the facility at one time because the turnover is fairly quick. <coughs> Mathematically, I think my calculation was somewhere, I, I think based on the square footage, uh, 
uh, I came up with something like 3,000 and change you could have popped on. Sounds about Is right. Is that about what you That does sound about right. Yeah. And the average duration that the car sits? Uh, approximately 30 days. So that would be, you know, most insurance, most of the insurance vehicles are total losses. They have to settle with their customer, get us the title work. We get the title work to the state. It takes that time to get the title back for us to be How able to sell it. about trucks, other vehicles, trailers, boats, construction equipment? We pick up everything. So it's, it wouldn't just necessarily be cars, motor The majority of cars, there's majority a very, of, yeah, there's a small, small there. percentage, yes, that would be other things. Okay. And same exact process is followed for those as well. To me, when I met with Mr. Powers, who was also <coughs> part me. of this, what you know, was Mr. Powers, when I was saying when I first really approached me about this <coughs> project, is they said, you know, <coughs> New England's going to have a hurricane sooner or later. We need a place to put the cars. He says that basically, they're, they're, how they started with having a disaster in an area and needing to take all these cars or underwater to put someplace. That's how they originally started. The original founder, who was a single individual of a, of a gas station. He's actually written, wrote a whole book on how he came up no, with this idea. The concept idea. is wonderful. The, yeah. issue, the issue was land use and the zoning regulations. That's correct. Florida. That's where we are. I think the business model is outstanding. Uh, okay. Anything else? Members of the board? No. All right. Anyone here in favor of this petition? You're in favor. Bill, you identify yourself for the record, please. William Demaris. Yes. Mr. Director Butter to the property. Can I have your address, William? 22 Alty Street, Florida, Mass. Alt, A-L-T-Y? A-L-T-Y. Like Salty, but Yes. Yes. You're a direct abutter, we and you're in favor of this. A little about 365 feet running, uh, abutting the property. And uh, we're in favor. We see it every day. I like to see the tanks come down. I like to see it be used for something else. And when I inquired about this proposal, they said they would do something with the waterfront there to make it look a lot better as far as putting the uh, greenery the 100 feet back from the waterfront. And I think it's a lot better than what it does now. And it's something that enables you to use that. And I thought about the vehicles going in and out. It was an exit and entrance to the highway right across from the facility on New Street. So I said, you know, it's not a bad idea to bring some tax to Fall River, make the area look better, get it in use. Thank you, Bill. Anyone else in favor of this petition? Joe, you're in favor of it? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Joe Farrier in favor. Is there anyone opposed to this petition? So this, this is how we're going to do it. I'll start. I'll work my way across. Councilor Camaria, you had your hand up. You're the lead off man. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I would hope that the board would, would uphold the decision of the uh, building inspector in, uh, in his denial of this uh, application. Uh, and I would ask you to um, oppose the variance request uh, the City of Fall River is currently in process of a committee right now uh, with uh, developing a waterfront uh, improvement plan as well as a downtown improvement plan. But this, this area specifically uh, is a significant part of that waterfront improvement plan. And I believe the city should be allowed to proceed without it being hindered uh, by a uh, project that I think would be detrimental to not only the neighborhood, but the city uh, as a whole. This is a prime parcel with waterfront uh, uh, accessibility to uh, the Taunton River, which was declared by Congress to be uh, a wild and scenic uh, river. Uh, there are great opportunities uh, to be developed, uh, not only on this side of the river, but also on the Somerset side, particularly directly across this particular parcel. So I think for us as a community to buy into this um, uh, basically storage facility of, uh, of, of wrecked vehicles uh, would, might, would not be detri would not be uh, beneficial uh, to our community nor to the neighborhood uh, that's being uh, considered. And, uh, also, I think that the chair uh, was was clear in presenting the many other opportunities that might be able to be developed on this particular parcel, uh, that would certainly be better uh, than what's being proposed. So I would ask the board, uh, and I commend you all for the work you do, but I would ask the board to uh, uphold the decision of the building inspector, uh, deny this uh, petition, uh, and let's uh, proceed with the city's uh, waterfront development plan <coughs> and see if we can find uh, a better use. 
adapted. Now, you know, if they could fit into one of the permitted uses, there'll be some use there, and that whole issue about the Fall River redevelopment or the, goes away because they'll be doing a use that's acceptable. Right. And I, I, just, I just want to be clear on that. that and there was there's a limited issue before this board right now is this auto sales, the parking, and... Okay? Yes, sir. <coughs> Anything else, Steve? Uh, no, that's it. I just uh, Mr. Uh, Lima, I saw you leave. Now that you're sitting next to Mr. Camara, would you like to be the next speaker? Were you, were you opposed to this petition? Yes, I am. <coughs> what I'd like to say is that uh, basically uh, the... Uh, 20 years of the North End Neighborhood Association provided you with some excellent uh, reasons for denying this petition and basically I would like to uh, support are, that. Are you that speaking petition. for the North End Neighborhood Association or are you speaking for yourself? No, no. Is I'm representing the Highland Neighborhood Association. I do. That's what I mean. What did you do? Yeah, no, no, I know, but I just wanted to make sure I had Mr. Lima down properly. All right, Bill, somebody on this? Wait, is there somebody hiding back there? Yeah, will you identify yourself, please? Mr. Jim Soul, uh, 577 Rock Street here in Fall River. I uh, do it uh, for that we don't uh, approve this variance. Uh, the philosophy that we can never do better in our lifetime is the very reason that Fall River is in our economic hardship in the one that we have been in. And so at some time, our leadership needs to endorse best use ideal, especially for such sensitive sites as this one. We can and will be more proactive to demand better someday. Please deny this variance. Have hope that you can expect better and give the city the chance for a better future. Thank you. Yeah, David, I, the gentleman behind you, no? No? David, identify yourself, please. David Dennis, 132 Highland Avenue. I'd ask the uh, board uh, to deny the petition uh, as a resident of the city of Fort Worth for mm -hmm. all of my life. Uh, I don't believe uh, that uh, uh, this particular proposal is the highest and best use of that property. It's really the last large tract of developable land on the Taunton <coughs> River in the Mount Hope Bay. Uh, it's some 74 plus acres. This I realize is only a portion of it, uh, but uh, it doesn't, and, and in my opinion, uh, the uh, uh, proposed use is, uh, would provide limited economic uh, uh, benefit to the city as opposed to uh, what could potentially be there, recognizing some of the limitations and recognizing uh, that uh, the, uh, the property is still being remediated and will be for some period of time. Uh, and again, I just don't see that, uh, that it really just does provide some limited uh, decision benefits with this proposal. I think there's a much higher and better use of that property uh, given its size, its location, uh, and, uh, and the other needs that uh, the city has and what, uh, what other options could be proposed for that uh, property. I would highly recommend that the, uh, the board uh, deny the petition. Thank you. This side? Okay. Nobody behind you? Yes, ma'am. Identify yourself, please. I'm Jane Mallow, and I live on Wilson Road in Fall River. Yes. And I think I'm asking the board to deny this also because I feel there's other things that you could use that would be better use. And, and I don't like the idea of these trucks going in and out all the time, <coughs> bringing traffic that at the bottom of Herman Street and the entrance and exit to the highway on 79. And I also worry about if something, if the, if the trucks would come off on Highland Avenue at the top of Wilson Road and add to the traffic that's already there. And I, that's why I don't feel it should go through. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Sir? No? You all set? Sir? Sir, you identify yourself, please. Yes. Uh, Joe Cavallo, 575 Eastern Avenue, Fall River, Mass. Um, <clears throat> President, actually this March will mark 16 years as the President of the Coalition for Responsible Siting of LNG Facilities, also the Vice President of the Flint Neighborhood Association. Now, uh, in those 16 years, we've approached every mayor asking 
requesting that they take the Weaver's Cove site by eminent domain. And uh, because it, uh, initially the, the owners, the Weaver's Cove Energy and SLNG, uh, had, had purchased the land for $16.2 million from uh, Jay Cashman. So, so the potential for the city taking it by eminent domain would have been prohibitive. Now, Mr. Tebow, who owns the property now, purchased it for $1.2 million, I believe. Uh, and every mayor that we've spoken to, with the exception of the current mayor, Jaisal Correa II, actually told myself and a member of Green Futures local environmental group, that his plan was for the redevelopment authority, the Fall River Redevelopment Authority, to, to take the land by eminent domain. Now, Mr. Lima, who's, who's a urban planner and has been for years, had put together a plan for that uh, land. And, uh, you know, to Attorney Levin's point about $4 going to wherever in the city, uh, the plan that Mr. Lima put together, and it's dated probably 2006 now, roughly 2006, modeled after Meditech on South Watapa Pond, and at that time, 13 years ago, would have brought in $1.5 million for that, for that land. I, I don't need to cut you off, but this is a very specific item before this board. Can you tell us why you're <coughs> objecting, what your opposition is? Shape, soil condition, topography, hardship, what elements haven't they met? All why of those. Yeah. As a I understand fact, that, but that's what I, the, the, what Mr. Lima, Mr. Lima can speak for himself. He, sure. he didn't say. It. So you, as the representative of the Coalition for Responsible Siting of LNG Facilities, <coughs> tell us about this particular, your opposition on this particular use on this particular site. Please. Well, this particular use on this particular site. Yes, please. When I went on the Copart website and looked at the pictures of some of the vehicles, uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest. The first thought that came into my mind was, this is a junkyard. The, the, one of the pictures had a headlight hanging out of the front of the car. Uh, and by the way, I've, I've contacted Shell Oil Corporation because they obviously have an interest in, in all of these 3,000 maybe vehicles being placed on the land. Uh, possibly no, no, that was my mathematical calculation. That leaking, the maximum yeah, they can put there. Fine. <laughs> Plus or minus, leaking possible oil, uh, uh, transmission fluid, you name it. So, so I, I was not ever impressed with what I saw on their website. And uh, to the point of, of best use, no, please. Best 73 uses. acres of waterfront property uh, going to be used. As, as a matter of fact, Mayor Flanagan, back in the day, uh, actually had a, a task force put together. There were maybe 25 people on that task force. And we presented at public hearings possibilities for the use of that land. And That's I'm, not before this board, sir. Got it. Understood. And historically, though, you know, the idea, uh, even to Mr. Soule's point, is that what we're going to have in Fall River? Is that the best use for 73 acres of waterfront property? Is salvaged? The best, use, the best use argument is not something for this board to consider. This board's limited in what it has to review. We've got the presentation of what the use is, what the proposed use is, and our view or our job under 48 section 10 is to review did they meet the criteria to grant the variance. I'm, I'm trying to hear, I've heard everyone's objection, I hear your objection, you don't want it. There are lots of things going on why you don't want it, and I understand that and I appreciate it. Uh, but what other mayors or what other planning, it, it's irrelevant to this board. At least for me it is. I can't speak for the other board members. But, uh, understood. But, understood. So. And, you know, the, the, the other uses that you pointed out, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's what I would say as well. Anything but 
but a salvage yard for, for damaged vehicles, you know, going in there. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there anyone? Did I miss anyone? There was also a letter that we received, uh, I think it was today, from Representative Carol A. Fiola, State Representative of the 6th Bristol District, uh, on behalf of the many North End residents and the North End neighborhood group who have contacted my office in opposition to the proposed variance for Copart of Connecticut and their intention to, among other things, to conduct a retail and wholesale auction of used, damaged, and undamaged operable, unoperable automobile, trucks, trailers, boats, and farm equipment, please accept this letter in opposition to the proposed variance based upon, number one, the fact that the proposed request does not create a substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the project proponent. Number two, granting of the variance will create a substantial detriment to the public good and without nullifying the substantially derogate from the intent or purpose of such ordinances or bylaw. Number three, the proposed use does not conform with allowable uses contained within a designated port area as specified in 301 CMR 25.00, which limits activities to water-dependent industrial uses. Clearly, this proposed use does not conform to the development plans identified in the city's draft urban renewal plan or other plans set forth by advocacy groups. As such, I believe the city of Fall River is its planning entities should be afforded the opportunity to properly plan and develop the site in accordance <coughs> with existing or modified regulations to realize the development of job creation potential that the site could accommodate. As the ZBA board is aware, the hardship must be more than an inconvenience or a preference for a more lenient standard, and this project does not reach this standard. As such, for the reasons stated above, I respectfully ask that the variance be denied. And I think, Attorney Levin, you've got this letter. You saw this. I did. And, and it Mr. kind of reflects what Mr. Cavallo Attorney Nyla can explain to you about the water. No, no. Let me finish <coughs> telling you, then I'm sure. going to give you a chance to. But I just want to make sure I get out of this. Yes, I did. Thank you. Heard, so you. So we had the North End Neighborhood Association. There was a letter dated January 15, 2019. Attorney <coughs> Levin responded on the 16th. We got a response letter back dated, and I think Attorney Levin, you've got this dated today. Uh, so North End Neighborhood Association basically says no, everything that we've heard today. Um, the Coalition for Responsible Sitting of the LNG Facility, Mr. Cavallo. Mr. Cavallo, I'm going to ask you later if you could just sign, because there's a copy of the letter in here, but it's not signed, so if you could sign it, that would be good. It's under your, it's set up for your signature. Um, Mr. Lemar, I believe, said you were representing the North, the, the Highland Association? Yes. Okay. All right. So those were the letters of opposition that we got. We've heard everyone. Attorney Levin, is there something you'd like to say in rebuttal? Or, or, if not you... Yeah, Attorney Nyla will explain. He's the environmental attorney. Uh, the LSP is here, too. But N -Y -N -I. he can... N-Y-L-E-N. Thank you. Richard. Richard. Um, so thank you, Chairman, members of the board. I think the, um, the most important point I'd like to make was your reading of the list of uses. I, I'm not sure that you heard us with respect to the restrictions, but no use at which a child's presence is likely can take place on this property. There's a reason why the fair market value went from 16 million to something less which is because there can be no recreation uses, so it can't be taken for a park. There can be no schools, no daycare, um, there are no, there's no residential, there's no waterfront uses because you have contaminated water and you don't have deep water. So I'm, I'm hearing about highest and best use, and I certainly um, can empathize with the community, but you have a piece of property that is restricted by deed, and as an attorney, you know what that means. So that, that can't be used for any of those other purposes. If it could have been used for other purposes, my client wouldn't have bought that. It would have been bought a long time ago and you would have had multiple uses that would have taken place. Shell is um, on the record. They're, they've indemnified all of the owners, so they will take care of cleaning up. But they put the restrictions on because they don't want anything to interfere with what's taking place for remediation and they don't want any liability in the event that there are children or others that are exposed to this site and then will file a lawsuit in Superior Court and claim that they've been harmed. So uh, when you read that list, 
Mr. Chairman, I think you gave the group an, a, a belief that all of these uses are allowed and they aren't because if there's any likelihood that a child's presence is, can take place, they're, they're not allowed. The second thing I want to say is this is just a use variance. All of the um, regulations for stormwater management, for uh, regulating the use of the site, those will take place with the Conservation Commission with site plan review and which will take care of a lot of the issues that have been raised. Uh, third, a question came up in terms of this being a DPA. The DPA is not an issue because the DPA is only regulated where the Chapter 91 area is, which is only five acres of the 50 acres. And a lot of that is within your setbacks anyway. So there's no prohibition from this use in the DPA, excuse me, it won't affect them because it's only a very, a very limited use. So I, I think it's important I think we would all love to have this waterfront for, I don't know, high rises or residential or something, but that's not going to happen until it's remediated. And that's why we have a hardship, because when you look at the uses in your regulations, we can't do them. If anyone could do them, they would have done this a long time ago. Talked about all the mayor cities talked about. It would have been taken for those purposes, it would have been used. So we think that a use variance is appropriate because of the shape that the that the site is in, and uh, and that this is the the best use. Uh, Co the reason Copart was here is because they see this wherever they locate. You know, we're all creatures of habit. When something comes in that we don't know about, we oppose it because we think the worst. There's going to be less traffic out there than if this was fully developed site. There would be far. You'd have all these people claiming that there was going to be traffic that was taking place. It'd be far less of an impact. We think that we meet the test, and, and we hope that you will consider that. Thank you. Um, but I did listen, and I did hear, and my response to Attorney Levin was the response that you couldn't, there was nothing else under the regs that you could do. And I made a point of reading them. There were other uses. I made them also the point, sir, that the, right, the, the restrictions also limit what you can do. So at least for me, I understood what was being presented. Yeah, and, I, and it wasn't and it wasn't giving anybody ammunition or saying I'm giving false hope. It was to make sure that it was clear that it wasn't just limited that you can't do anything in this neighborhood. You you certainly uh, characterize it correctly, Mr. Chairman. But when I heard the response from the from the audience. I think they heard something different, and that, that's why I wanted to stand up just to make sure that they understand, because I, I know that you and the members do. Thank you. Okay. Members of the board, you've heard the presentation. You've heard those in favor, those opposed. Uh, I should probably ask the Director of Planning if he has any input that we should consider or think about. I think everything's good. Okay. So, we, this is the proposal. What do we want to do? Do we want to grant with conditions? Do we want to deny? Can I get a motion to grant? Can I get a motion to deny? Make a motion to deny. Motion to deny by Carolyn. Do I have a second? A second. Jim, Dan Dupier, a second. Any discussion on the motion? Okay. All those in favor? Dan, Carolyn, Jim? I'm in favor of denying. You're, you're in favor of denying. So, denial three. David? No, you're opposed to it. Assad, four. So you have four in favor of denial, one in favor against the motion. So this petition is denied. Thank you very much. Nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let me find it. I think she, she may have it. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought he wanted me to sign. And I think Brittany's got them in her hand. Okay, I'll, I'll yeah, see her. Yeah, Joe, just, it's just that the letter wasn't signed. And I yeah, want to get some Thank you. Okay, can we take it outside, please, so we can move on with our meeting? I wanted him to sign. I couldn't find it.
Do we have any citizen input? No citizen input. The next order, the next order of business is the approval of the minutes from the November 15, 2018 meeting. Uh, I know Brittany has sent them all out to everyone. Is there any additions or deletions that we need to know about? Have it moved that we waive the reading and motion that we grant that we approve the minutes as prepared. Jim, we approve the, yes. that's your motion? Yes. Second. Se second, all those in favor? Okay, so the minutes of the November 15th meeting are approved. The approval of the minutes of December 13th, 2018 meeting are not ready. Drafts have been done, but they're not ready for final review. Is that correct, Brittany? So the December 13th minutes will be heard at the February meeting. Um, there was, I think you all received, uh, a copy of the open meeting law complaint that was, I think it was, you say filed on December 15, 2018 by a gentleman by the name of Colin Dyers regarding alleged violation of, quote, members of the board in communication regarding a petition prior to the meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals, December 13, 2018. Um, I don't, maybe Brittany's got a copy of it. Um, I know that when it was received, I think it was received by Brittany around the 17th of December. The last page. The last page would have the date on. Yeah, it's too small for my eyes. December 15th. December 17th. December 17th, 2018. It was received. It's from a gentleman by the name of Colin Dias, 560 Ray Street, Fall River, Mass. 02720, he gives his phone number and he gives his email address. I'm filing this as an individual, a public body that's the subject of the complaint, is a city public body for a zoning board of appeals. Specific persons, if any, you allege committed this violation, it says the whole board, date of alleged violation, 12 13 2018. Um, and it says the description of the alleged violation is. On Thursday, December 13th, the Florida Zoning Board of Appeals held a public meeting. During the meeting, they granted two permits for Fall River Council Steve Camara. Members of the board were in communication with Councilor Steve Camara and Mayor Jaisal F. Correa II before the meeting regarding granting Councilor Camara the permits. This is a clear and an obvious violation of the open meeting law. It's signed, let's see, what action he wants nullification of any permit granted to Councilor Steve Herrera, signed by Colin Dias, and it's dated 12 15 2018. So, my recollection is this came, we put it on the agenda for tonight, it was within the 14 days in terms of response. My recollection is the Corporation Council was, was given a copy or sent a copy. Brittany doesn't seem to have that in her emails. So the, what we have done in the past uh, is we've normally gotten the response. We, all of you have gotten it. We send it up to Corporation Council to respond uh, to the particular action. Uh, I don't, the, the wholeness of the whole board, I, I, I can't respond. I don't know. So I guess we'll all have to cooperate with Corporation Council in terms of any communication but I don't, I don't know of any for myself. Uh, yeah, I, I can state that I spoke neither to Mayor Career or... Uh, yeah, I know. I mean, we all say the same thing, so I, I don't know the answer, but I think that the appropriate action would be to send it to Corporation Council and have Corporation Council respond, and if there's anything that the Corporation Council needs to talk to us about, they can contact us, is, uh, if that's an appropriate measure by all of you. And that's fine. I would just also state for the record, I certainly was not in communication with anyone prior to a meeting about that in June 9th. Yeah, no, I, well, nor was I. I will, for the record, um, and I can't remember the day, but Councilor Camara, I saw him in housing court one day, and we had a discussion about a committee that he was forming for the purposes of studying uh, a new form of government. And there was a communication between myself and Councilor Camara where I notified him that I uh, was honored that he asked me to be on the committee, but I declined. And that was the extent of my communication with Councilor Camara. Uh, but uh, so I think the appropriate action would be send it to Corporation Council, have Corporation Council do it. So, motion to do I that? I move that we verify okay. and if, that it has been sent, and if not, that it be resent to okay. the. Uh, 
Corporation Council. Second. Second. Second by Dan. All those in favor? Okay, so that takes care of the open meeting law complaint. Um, I think there's no other business that we can discuss oh, because it's not adjournment. Second. Second. All those in favor? The floor of the Zoning Board of Appeals for January 17, 2019 is closed. Thank you.